Hey, before we get into the message today, I wanna give you the greatest opportunity that you'll have all year. Every year, Transformation Church and Transformation Nation gathers our faith, and we bring a one-time end-of-the-year offering. And this year, it's our crazy faith offering on December 15th. I want you to pray about being a part of this monumental moment that's gonna expand the kingdom of God and allow us to represent him to the lost and the found for transformation in Christ. This year, our faith is charged and we're going to give in expectation that God's gonna do more with a bunch of us giving whatever he tells us to, to transform the world. Haggai chapter one, verse eight tells us that to go into the mountain, bring down the timber, and then we will build God's house. This is what I'm saying. I want you to go up to the mountain, pray. Ask God, what am I supposed to give? And then I want you to gather those resources, the finances, and I want you to bring them to the house so that we can build this house together. This is gonna be the best year of our Crazy Faith offering. And December 15th, I cannot wait for us all to give together. Make sure you get this card that says, what am I believing God for in crazy faith? Fill it out, post it on your social media, post it on your car, post it anywhere you can remember because we're believing that God's going to do some crazy things as we give in crazy faith. Since I've been refired and now traveling, I help pastors through coaching and, uh, and succession planning. I had to walk through that, so I'm able to do that and help pastors. My wife is still counseling and uh, teaching. She teaches Chinese students English every morning online. That means our morning starts at 4 a.m. My wife is not a morning person, and I thought I was until we started getting up at 4 a.m. That doesn't seem like morning. It seems like the middle of the night, really. And uh, she goes upstairs to teach, and I stay downstairs, and I start my mornings out with devotions, and then I look at my calendar every morning. I look at my calendar, and then I always check the weather. Uh, I like nice weather, and I always check the weather. And one time, she came downstairs after she was teaching, and she said, well, what's the weather like? She knows I check it out, and I said, it's dreary, it's cloudy, it's overcast, and it's going to be that way for the next two or three days. We like the sun both S-O-N and S-U-N, we like the sun. When we go on vacation, we find somewhere warm with lots of sun. But this particular day, I said it's cloudy and overcast with an attitude. But then the Lord reminded me of a text that talks about a cloud and about God coming in that cloud. And so this morning, I want to read the scripture and preach from the subject, cloudy faith. Yeah. Come on, look somebody around beside you say, cloudy faith. Now, it took some working for me to see that God could come in a cloud because the sun should have come in the sun. But he came in a cloud to the children of Israel. So with that in mind, I want to take a look at the children of Israel in the desert who are going to the promised land, and we'll read our scripture, chapter number 9 of Numbers, starting in verse number 15, reads as follows. On the day the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered it. From morning until evening, the cloud was over the tab tabernacle, and at night, it was a pillar of fire. This was the regular pattern. At night, the cloud that covered the tabernacle had the appearance of fire. Whenever the cloud lifted from over the sacred tent or tabernacle, the people of Israel would break camp and follow it. And whenever the cloud settled, the people of Israel would set out and camp. In this way, they traveled and they encamped at the Lord's command. Whenever he told them to go, they went. Then they remained in their camp for a long time. The cloud stayed over the tabernacle. If the cloud remained over the tabernacle for a long time, the Israelites stayed and performed their duty to the Lord. Sometimes the cloud would stay over the tabernacle for only a few days. 
so the people would stay for only a few days as the Lord commanded. Then at the Lord's command, they would break camp and move on. Sometimes the clouds stayed over only overnight, and in the morning, it lifted. But that day or night, the cloud lifted, the people broke camp and moved on. Whenever the cloud stayed over or above the tabernacle for two days or a month or a year, the people stayed in camp and did not move. But as soon as it lifted... They broke camp and moved on. So they camped or traveled at the Lord's command, and they did whatever the Lord told them through Moses. Come on, say cloudy faith. So let's take a look at the children of Israel as they were moved from Egypt to the promised land. History tells us that Moses, of course, was raised by Pharaoh's wife and yet nursed by his mother, but he made some mistakes. He ended up killing an Egyptian who was fighting a Hebrew, and he had to flee for his life. And now we pick up the story. Moses comes back to Pharaoh because God had heard the cry of the children of Israel who were being oppressed, and Moses said, let my people go. Of course, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and So God said, well, I can work with that. And he gives 10 plagues. Blood, all the water became blood. Frogs, lice. If I was Pharaoh at lice, I would have let them go. Then flies, livestock were killed. Then boils, I sure would have let them go at that point. Then hail, then locusts, then darkness for three solid days. where They couldn't even move. And then lastly, the death of the firstborn. And Pharaoh said, maybe I ought to rethink this through. He let him go. And then Pharaoh had a change of heart again. And he started pursuing them with his whole army. He was pursuing the nation of Israel. It was so interesting because I was rereading this the other day. And I saw this and it it just shocked me. The cloud that was leading the children of Israel moved from in front of them and went behind them. And so Pharaoh pursuing the children of Israel now is enshrouded in a cloud and they can't see. Now you know the story. So in that process, uh, God moves upon the Red Sea and makes a passageway. Amen. And the children of Israel... We're, we're being chased by Pharaoh and a Red Sea they couldn't cross and God makes a way. How many know God knows how to make a way for you? Amen. Even when it doesn't look good, God can make a way. Even when the enemy says, I got you now, God can make a way. Come on, somebody. Because the cloud that was leading them now covers them by stopping their enemy. I wish I'd get somebody to get this this morning. The enemy that's chasing you is about to experience the cloud of God that's leading you. When the church is on move, he often stops the advances of the enemy that are against the church. Now they journey to the promised land. I mean, you know the rest of the story. The cloud lifts, goes back to the children of Israel, lead them, and Pharaoh said, we got them now, and they start chasing them, and they have a little water problem at that point in their lives. So what really this journey depicts, the promised land to Egypt, is our journey in life. Every one of us starts at a point where there's bondage in our life. We become slaves to something in our life. Oh, and that doesn't just mean alcohol or drugs or pornography. It might mean you're addicted to yourself. See, there, there's lots of things that weigh us down and bind us up, and we all came there. By the way, there's no degrees of lostness. You can be as lost behind an executive desk on the 60th floor as being on the street. If you're lost, you're lost. We all need that process where God sends a Moses to our life to bring us out of darkness into his marvelous light. A Moses that comes for every generation and delivers us, which means freedom from, 
and gives us guidance, which means freedom too. You see, you can come out of Egypt, but Egypt has to come out of you. So the children of Israel came out of Egypt, but Egypt was still in them because they had been there for 40 years. And, and the problem with that is that in that process of being bound, it, God became the God of their ancestors and not the God of their life. So now they come out of Egypt, the Bible says, armed for battle, but God said, if I take them the short routes, they're going to try to fight and get discouraged because they've been bound too long. They don't know how to fight anymore. In other words, armed for battle, but afraid to fight. And so I'll have to take them around and teach them and train them in the process. And so we call that cloudy faith realizing that God now has to lead us and retrain us as his people. And so now they're going around, and Moses says, actually in, in Exodus 33, says, if your presence does not go with us, then don't send us. And I need a sign, God, because I know this is not going to be an easy assignment. That makes me... Think about when Pastor Michael said, he said, you didn't tell me about everything. He said, you didn't, you didn't tell me about this or that. And I thought, that's because if I'd have told you everything, you might have said, I'm going to go ahead and go to California. <laughs> it, was, it was persuasion without truth. Okay, so... So Moses said, I need a sign, and Exodus 40 tells us that the sign was a cloud, that I'm going to go with you, and I'm going to identify myself with you at such a level that the people in the world and the people that you go through their territory are going to realize God is with you. Come on, say cloudy faith. faith. So let's take a look at the Israelites in their camp. And I want to journey with them. So, oops, wrong slide. That's what I would want to do. My, my wife always calls me a Hilton missionary. In other words, I'll mission anywhere in the world as long as there's a Hilton. And No, no, no. Let, let's take a look. Here, there are 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, that's good. Okay. There are 12 tribes of Israel. There's over 600,000 among the tribes, and they would encamp according to tribe around the tabernacle, which represents the presence of God. And close to them, of course, would be the tribe of Levi and the priests. And they would stay as close to the tabernacle. Levi's were responsible for the tabernacle. And now God's leading them doesn't seem the right way because it would have been much quicker but God's retraining them because they're in a process. They're in a process. Pastor Michael calls it pro progression. They're in a progression of being retrained by God to hear his voice and to follow his guidance, and oftentimes through Moses as, they gave, as Moses gave them commands. And so now the tribes of Israel are relearning who their God is, and they, they, they camp in order around the tabernacle, keeping his presence at the very center. Now, this, this, the numbers represent about 600,000, but, but some, some authors believe that there could have been more. That was just the men. We don't know, but it was a lot of people, all right? A lot of people. And so the next, version, next slide shows you just a little bit, and this is one uh, author's version of it, and I love it because it's in the sign of a cross. But here the tribes of Israel, again, would surround the tabernacle, and above the tabernacle was the cloud. And so this helped them in the process. And at night, the Bible says that there was, was still a cloud, but it looked like fire. How many know at this point, you know, because they're in tents. There's not Hiltons in the desert, amen? There was tents, and so they were in their tents. And the children of Israel had to follow the cloud. And our text tells us if it was one day, they would set up camp. And the next morning, they would have to pack camp. 
It could have been a month. It could have been a year. But at the Lord's command, they set out or they encamped. That's what our text told us. And I would imagine if there were some people like some people, certainly not us, but some other people, they would say, hey, you know, let's help God. Because this doesn't make sense. I mean, one day, one week, a month, a year. Let's, let's form a committee. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say denominational name, but let's form a committee. And we'll help God and we'll put together a plan so it's, it's, it's better planned out. I mean, you know, a, a month of camping and then a week of traveling and then a month of camping. Let's see if we can help God, but that wasn't God's intention. It wasn't about camping, and it wasn't about traveling. It was about hearing my voice. It's about following my command. It's about letting, letting you know that I'm God, and I know what I'm doing, and I will not take you into the promise until I change your life, and you follow my guidance, because that's the only way you're going to make it. Now, if we had time, we'd talk about when they arrived at the promised land that there were some enemies that didn't like them, and they had to fight. So he had to change them in the process, amen? Sometimes the promise isn't just given. The promise has to be fought for. So let's, let's, let's take a look at some things now, the order of the camp. So first of all, I want to talk about what cloudy faith represents. First of all, the cloudy faith represents God's covering for protection. God's covering for protection. During the day, it was a cloud, and in the desert, the sun is your worst enemy in the desert, so he became a cloud, which means he shaded the nation of Israel. And at night it was fire, and even though the desert's hot during the day, it gets cold at night. And he said, I'll be fire at night. In other words, I got you covered. Yes. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, God's got you. God's got you. In the world, we live among a lot of disturbed people. How many know, and it doesn't hurt to have God's protection over your life. I believe many times there are things that God does that we don't even know he does that keeps protection over our life. In other words, you misplace your keys and now you're five minutes late before you find them. But there was an accident about to happen and God said, no, I got you. I, I got you. I know you're frustrated, but don't you worry about it. I got you covered. I got you covered. So the cloud represents God's covering and protection. Secondly, it represents God's direction for the future. God's direction for the future. The cloud is moving, and when it moves, it's moving you towards your future. See, sight only sees the present. Vision sees the future. Sight only sees where you're at. Vision sees where you're going. Sight sees present problems. The future sees future possibilities. Sight tells you why you can't. Future tells you why you can. Sight often produces despair. Vision gives hope for a promise. Sight reminds you of your past. Future talks about your future. Come on. God's doing something that's fantastic. He's moving us into the future. And that's why Jeremiah tells us the verse we all quote, but we don't live. For I know the plans I have for you. I got this worked out. I got where I'm taking you worked out. Just trust me in this. I have plans for you. Transformation Church, I got plans for you. If I told you everything at the beginning, it would overwhelm you, but it's laid out for you. You just stay with me and follow the cloud. And thirdly, it represents the cloudy faith represents God's authorization on leadership. The last verse we read, they encamped and traveled at the Lord's command, and they did whatever the Lord told them through Moses. It represents God's authorization on leadership. By the way, there still is good leadership. Are there problems in some leadership? Yes, but there's still good leadership. And how many know Pastor Michael is a good leader? We wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for his leadership. Somebody said, man, how'd you, how'd you all believe God for $6 million to put down that building? I said, Pastor Michael did it. 
He has staff around him, but he believed God, and he didn't spend it. A lot of young pastors would have spent it faster than it's coming in. He saved it. In two years, two years, come on, say two years. Two years. He saved that money, amen, and thank God for good leadership. Good leadership. We were at four services in the other building. And I was told that many times at 11 o'clock, they'd turn away as many as 200 people trying to get in. We couldn't take another year and a half to stay there. So Pastor Michael, last night at the conference, heard, don't go back, move forward. He heard the last night of the conference, move with the cloud. Move with the cloud. I'm bringing you to a new place. And we did the best we could to get the word out in just a few days from Thursday night to Sunday morning. And there are a few people that didn't get it, but most everybody got it. Amen. And we here and we're doing right well. Amen. Come on, somebody. We're doing right well. So let me give you a moment of prophetic insight. I've been checking lately. I've been watching. I travel all over, the, all over this nation. I travel almost... almost two to three Sundays a month, and I'd rather be here. Hope to change my schedule this year. But I've been traveling, and I've been watching, and I've been observing. And what I'm observing in this hour, prophetically, is the cloud is moving. I said the cloud is moving. And that's why it takes cloudy faith. It takes faith to believe that this move is of God. That, that, that What are you doing trying to get a $54 million building? And what are you doing trying to move those people over there before you do all the remodeling and everything? The cloud is moving. And you got to move with the cloud. Come on, say move with the cloud. But it takes cloudy faith. So let me give you four things this morning. I'll get out of your way. Four things that cloudy faith moves. When cloudy faith moves, number one, there's an impartation of gifting. An impartation of gifting. Somebody said, what is impartation? It's something instilled in you or upon you that oftentimes you haven't paid for. It's given to you or it's deposited in you, impartation. Partation means you get it down on the inside. See, some people hear truth, other people get revelation. See, truth has to become revelation. Truth understood without the revelation cannot change you. So you have to get it. You have to get it. That's why you're listeners of the word. You're receiving the word, but you got to get it down on the inside. It's got to be yours. The revelation of cloudy faith is mine. And we'll find out if cloudy faith is really yours when we take the offering in December. Amen. Because the, if, if you do what you've never done before, you got the revelation down on the inside. We have to get the revelation. So there's an impartation of gifting when cloudy faith moves. In Numbers chapter 11, it said, The Lord came down in a cloud and spoke to Moses. Then he gave the 70 elders the same spirit that was upon Moses. And when the spirit rested on them, they prophesied. There was an impartation upon people who were not prophets when they submitted to the voice of Moses, they got an impartation. Now, it doesn't mean they became prophets because they didn't prophesy after that day. But, but we understand that in that moment, God gave them an impartation, which means you're in the right place at the right time to get something that you didn't pay for. But I'm going to use you at a level that I've never used you before. You might have to make a business presentation, and you've prepared and you're ready, but somehow you want to make sure that every person in that room gets what you have to say at a whole different level. And it's in that moment that sometimes God says, I'm going to give you an impartation. They won't be able to understand it. They won't be able to identify it, but there's going to be something in that presentation that you're going to realize, God gave me an impartation, and I came and presented, and it was well-received, and you get a promotion or something like that. Amen. There's an impartation. An impartation. Often our daughter worked for a, a computer uh, tech corporation and, 
And they used to always say, Angela, we want you to do the presentation to the board. And I, she said, why? She said, there's something about your presentation. They didn't know to call it the anointing that's been upon her life since she was a little girl. But she had that thing on her. It was an impartation. So when cloudy faith comes, it's going to bring a, a, a impartation of gifting upon your life. You're going to get it in that moment. You're going to get it in that moment. Come on, say, I'm ready for my impartation. <laughs> Secondly, there's an interruption. When cloudy faith moves, there's an interruption of routine. An interruption of routine. Those of us that are systematic and structured, that means God, God often interrupts your routine. When I started pastoring, my routine went out of the window. Amen. Because there was always things to do and always needs and some crisis and all of that. But there's an impartation, but he interrupts your routine. He interrupts your routine. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 10, it says this. When the priest came out of the holy place, there was a thick cloud that filled the temple of the Lord. The priests could not continue their service because of the cloud. For the glorious presence of God filled the temple of the Lord. The priests had responsibilities and duties. But the Bible says when the cloud filled the temple, they couldn't do their normal routine. He interrupts your routine. And oftentimes, because we have everything worked out and planned out, we don't like interruptions to our routine. I was told a recent story of a parent that came down and they were, they were strong coffee drinkers and every morning they'd wander out to try to find the coffee pot and, and get some coffee and then their morning would begin but this day they went to get their coffee and they realized that the kids ran out of milk and so they took their coffee cream and put it on their cereal and they didn't have any cream for their coffee. Upset the man runs out and goes to Quick Trip and buys some cream, but in the process, he meets an old friend. The old friend was in a crisis. Everything was falling apart in their life. And that man had the word of the Lord for his friend that changed his life. And he's in church and leadership today as a result of it. Sometimes God interrupts your routine to do something that he needs done for the kingdom of God. And so he interrupts our little systems and our structure to help us do the things he's called us to do. Number three, when cloudy faith moves, there's an intervention of seasonal change. An intervention of seasonal change. Our, our text tells us in 1 Kings chapter 18 that there's a servant to the prophet Elijah. They had just defeated the prophets of Baal, Mount Carmel, you know the story, and now they're going out. And Elijah had prophesied that there would be a famine. There had been a famine in the land for two and a half years. A famine means no rain. No rain means no food. You have a famine. Nobody, Elijah is not a, 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 an exciting prophet. He didn't prophesy a Cadillac or new house. He prophesied a famine. Mm-hmm. Take that for what it's worth. So now he's coming out and he tells the servant, he said, go to the sea and tell me what you see. Go to the SEA and tell me what you see. Mount Carmel's close to the Red Sea. So he would go to the Red Sea. And so he said, he said, go and tell me what you see. He goes to the Red Sea and he said, there's a sea. Goes back to the prophet and said, I saw nothing. Just the sea, you know there's sea out there. I didn't see anything at the sea. He said, go again. Okay, goes back again, looks, there's the sea, goes back and said, Prophet Elijah, just the sea out there. He said, go again, third time, fourth time, fifth time, sixth time. He comes back the sixth time. He said, Prophet there's nothing out there. It's just sea. I mean, the sea looks good. I saw the sea. <laughs> that wasn't what the prophet was looking for. 
because the prophet had already heard it. And he's asked the sermon, tell me if you see what I heard. I heard the sound of abundance of rain. For two and a half years, there's been a famine in the land, but there's about to be a seasonal change. It goes back the seventh time, and he said, I'm out here again. The prophet has lost his mind. There's nothing out here. He starts to go back and tell the prophet, and then... He was jumping because he was happy. He finally saw something. He said, it ain't much, but I can go back and tell him I saw something. So he goes back to tell the prophet, now don't get too excited, but I, I saw a small little cloud about the size of a man's hand. By the time the words got out, Elijah's jumping up and down. He said, you better run. I heard it. It ain't no small cloud. The rain is coming. The season is about to change. I'm about to do something I've never done before. You thought it was all over. It's just beginning now. See, some of you thought the drought would never end. But I came this morning to tell you that I hear the sound of abundance of rain. I hear something shifting and something changing for your life. Oh, it's all over now. No, it ain't, honey. It ain't over till God says it's over. And it's not over till he rains on that thing. He's about to bring new life into something that's old. I, I, I haven't seen anything for a long time. Keep looking, keep looking, keep looking, keep looking. Come on. When cloudy faith moves, there's a seasonal change. Don't miss it. We're right between seasons right now in the natural. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. My wife and I love sun and the beach. And when it gets winter, it's not exciting. But I can say, I don't like winter. I refuse winner. I rebuke you winner. I will not submit to you winter. I'm going to keep my shorts and t-shirt on this winter. And I mean, no winter will kill you if you don't change clothes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't miss the season. Now listen to me. The church right now is in between seasons. It's not a bad thing. And those of you that go to this church don't think so. But we are. But the rest of the body of Christ, lots of the body of Christ is. I'm going to get there. I'm going to talk to you about that. But we're in between seasons. We're no longer at summer. We're not quite at winter, even though it feels like it's summer mornings recently. We're not in winter yet. We're in between. But God said... I'm about to shift this thing. I'm about to change this thing. I'm about to change seasons on you. And in the natural, the seasons come naturally. Different times, but naturally the seasons come. But in the realm of the spirit, God can shift any time, anywhere. He can look at one and say, your winter is over. The springtime of your life is now beginning. I'm about to shift things for you. I'm about to take you through summer, amen, of your life. I'm about to take you into fall, amen. You're about to experience things. that Because in the winter, we we want to rebuke it. If you don't like cold weather, you don't like it. I don't like it. I was raised in Ohio, born in Michigan, raised in Ohio. It's cold. I remember drifts off the top of our house. I never wanted to see another winter. When I came to Tulsa, I said, I never want to see another winter. But in the wintertime... Your roots grow deeper. So don't always resist winter because 
because it grows your roots deeper. They find the depth. They find moisture deeper. They grow deeper. They grow out. They grow stronger. But winter will come to an end, and spring is about to come. There's an intervention of seasonal change. And then fourthly, lastly, when cloudy faith moves, there's an invasion of presence. There's an invasion of presence. Now, nobody loves worship more than me. That's why I'm never late for praise and worship. Never. I was telling somebody earlier, I went to a church, and they said, we have a room for you. We'll come back and get you at 1030. Well, service started at 10. And I looked at them and said, what do you mean you're going to come get me at 1030? <laughs> well, we thought you'd be wanting this time to prepare. I said, if I didn't come prepare, you don't want me to preach. <laughs> and secondly, if God inhabits the praises of his people, and you're out there with praise and worship, why would I want to be back here? Excuse me, I'm going out. They said, well, the pastor is not here yet. I said, have them come meet me. I'll be in the sanctuary. And I walked right out in the sanctuary because I'm going to get mine. I don't know about you. I'm going to get mine. I'm going to enter in. Great victory comes through praise and worship. But this invasion of presence is different than just sweet little music. In Isaiah chapter 19, verse 1, it says, The message came concerning Egypt. Look, the Lord is advancing against Egypt. He's riding on a swift cloud. Hear me, hear me. The idols of Egypt tremble, and the heart of the Egyptians that slaved the children of Israel melted with fear. There is a presence that's coming in this next move of God that is so power, it's an invasion. God's going to invade atmospheres and realms in the spirit, and he's going to shift things. And the enemies that have tried to come against you and the things that have tried to plague your mind are going to melt in his presence. Are going to melt in his presence. I share some of this without going into the great depth, which we may not be ready for, that on September 11, 2019, 9.30 p.m., God invaded this auditorium at a level I haven't seen in my entire life. This is my 46th year of pastoring. I was five when I started. (laughs) <laughs> but that Wednesday night, that Wednesday night, God came in here in a very unusual way, and He spoke to my heart and said, "The cloud is moving." And in that moment, that night, because I had to leave early the next morning. He spoke to me and he said, this is a moment in time that's going to change the world. Now, there are many spots, I call them hot spots, throughout the country and around the world right now. But the majority of people are not experiencing what you get to experience every Sunday morning. And that's why thousands upon thousands watch through Transformation Nation. And we love you. Thank God for you. Thank God for you. 50 states and 30 nations were here that took that moment in time. And I believe there's a movement that is happening throughout the earth, a movement that has started that we get to be right in the middle of, right in the middle of it. There's a movement in this church. Don't take this place for granted. What you get here every Sunday is not normal. Ask some of our speakers who come, ask Craig Rochelle what he felt. There's something here that's incredibly powerful because it's more than a moment. Because when a moment has movement, it gains momentum. 
it gains momentum. And it's happening all over the world, I believe. And we get to be a part of it. We get to be right in the middle of it. The cloud is moving. Move with the cloud. I said the cloud is moving. Move with the cloud. Well, this is not normal. This is a little different. The cloud is moving. Move with the cloud. Move with the cloud. I love every time the doors of this church are open. Sometimes even when it isn't open. I came here three times last week. And I brought slides and stuff like that. But I, I just wanted to be here. I came here Saturday night. Because I just wanted to be in this auditorium. Because I believe God was preparing something. The cloud is moving. Move with the cloud. Everything in, around, and in and around your life is changing. It's shifting. You're right where you're supposed to be. Move with the cloud. Come on, if you believe that, clap your hands to the Lord. You might be here this morning or watching online or maybe even watching YouTube a week or two later. If you're not connected to the cloud, and we better would say not connected to the God who resides in the cloud that's moving in this hour, don't try to make it in life without Jesus. Don't try to live your life, because all of us tried to live our life, and we all made messes of our life, did we not? And however that form or fashion happened, we all made messes of our life, but thank God to Jesus who rearranged us and now is guiding us through our life for him. If you're here this morning and you don't know him personally, see, the children of Israel knew all about him, but they only knew him as the God of their ancestors because they were bound up on the inside and outside. If you don't know him this morning, why not yield everything to him? Why not make him Lord and Savior of your life. Why not give your life to Christ? It's one thing to come to church. It's another thing to have this life down on the inside of you. Even if I wasn't saved, I would love this place. But if I kept coming to this place, I'd want something down on the inside that would change me when I left this place. If you really don't know him as your personal Lord and Savior, why not this morning? Make him Lord and Savior of your life. With every head bowed, every eye closed, all over this auditorium, Lord, I thank you. Your cloud is moving. But as a family, there's maybe some among us that we would be moving without them. God, we don't want that. We love them with the love of the Lord. And they would add so much. If you're here this morning or watching online or even watching YouTube, and this moment in time, you want to make Jesus Lord. Then I'm going to ask you to pray with me all over this auditorium. In fact, if you're here this morning and that's you, just lift your hand and say, that's me. I don't want to play religion. I don't want to play church. But I want Jesus to be Lord of my life. I want him to be Lord of everything. I want to give my life to him. Or I want to renew my relationship with him. If that's you, just lift your hand. You can put it back down. Let me see. Thank you. Yes, 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 yes. There are others. Thank you. Thank you. If you're watching online, all over this room, pray everybody together. Say, Lord Jesus, today, right now, give me cloudy faith. You're here right now. Your presence is here right now. Help me to learn to navigate in life because I'm asking you, Jesus. Be Lord and Savior. Wash me in your blood. Cleanse me from all my crazy ways. And let me serve you. In Jesus' name. Can I get an amen? Amen. God bless you this morning. Thank you, Thank you so much for watching Transformation Church's YouTube. And I just want you to take another step. If this is feeding you, join Transformation Nation. That's everybody that doesn't live here in Tulsa watching live with us on Sunday mornings. Gather your family. Let's make this thing an every week situation. And please share. 
Share if it has impacted your life. There is somebody that is waiting for you to share this with them. And transformation is only a click away. And there's one more thing I would ask you to do. Pray about giving. If you wanna help us take this message all around the world and represent God to lost and found people for one reason, transformation in Christ, you can do that right now by clicking the give button. I cannot wait to see you the next time we're here. Live a transformed life.